Thank you, Monty. I will be really talking about uh, building or rebuilding livelihoods in protracting crisis. More specifically, our session did discuss successful case studies in building livelihoods through agriculture research and development in countries affected by wars, civil strife, and natural disaster. Now, we are talking about countries where national institutions, in most cases, have been destroyed. Farmers, small farmers in particular, are going back as refugees to their land with nothing on the ground. And this is a very important challenge to the global community, as well as to the stakeholders of GCART. We know very well that poverty and human misery is very much associated with these crises. Now, we did have very lively discussion with representatives of various stakeholders in this session, and uh, some of the outcomes include the following. We did share, as I mentioned, the lessons learned and past experience and success achievements in Afghanistan, Haiti, Iraq, and Rwanda, which really provided very good, valuable resources for us all to show how best we can improve livelihood through agriculture research and development. Now, the disaster preparedness, leadership and vision, capacity development, emphasis on seed relief, particularly as an entry point, rapid impact of agriculture technologies and rural development, has been really very important aspects of the interventions of the international community. One important aspect which we really realize that there isn't much coordination among the institutions that are contributing to rebuild livelihoods in these countries. And therefore, rebuild coordination is so important at the national level and certainly everybody should really work closely with the national institutions to make sure that their contribution is very well coordinated. Now, another aspect which we really did talk about, that it is very essential that we phase out the food aid emergency uh, so that we move more towards sustainable development. This has been really a very serious problem in many countries where food emergency is extended for a long time to the point that people tend to rely on food emergency rather than on producing their own food. So this is really a very important aspect. Uh, one important uh, also outcome of our session is the commitments to collective action. And this has been really been based in the Kigali movement where the establishment of a consultative learning platform among what we call two PCs, uh, countries affected by protracted crisis or countries uh, that are in post-conflict uh, 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 post situations. And we are talking about this consultative learning platform that uh, involves Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and certainly Latin America is welcome. There is a needs assessment for identifying priorities and inventory of physical resources in these countries. Capacity development, again, of national research institutions, extension and advisory services, producer organizations, local communities, and the stewardness of agro-dealership system is very important at both the formal and the informal level. Now, regional integration of agricultural research for development strategies are important so that we can really pool our limited resources in order to address the challenges that are facing any one region. So we have also to give attention to value change development as well as linking farmers to market and uh, do agriculture as a business rather than as a subsistence agriculture with the small farmers, and thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've gone through a marathon trip here. Uh, actually, we've had 17, 18 presentations in just over one and a half hour, and uh, I, I must say that we are sorry for the 
confu the confusion at the start of this session. We thought that they were presenting collated uh, 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 conclusions of each of the three sessions as indicated in the program, but we had 17, 18 speakers, and, and I think that they've done a wonderful job to give a sum summary of the outcomes of their session. And I think it's a good thing as well that we had to bring in the, 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 the chairperson of each of these sessions to put their conclu conclusions to, uh, to plenary. So we are not, I'm afraid, we're not going to go into questions and, and comments, as I indicated earlier on. Uh, but I would request that if you do have any burning issues that you want to discuss with any of the speakers, please meet with them at break time and iron out the issues. But let's give the speakers a Round of applause for doing a very good job. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on, and uh, I will call on the CEO of the CGIAR to come to the podium, and of course, Mark to also come to the podium. And we have down here five minutes, but Mark, I'm afraid we have to reduce this to about three minutes each you know, so that we go through the program, uh, 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 a big program that we've got ahead of us, you know. So, who is starting? Any of you? Good morning. Wow, what a rich set of ideas. I think quite representative of, of the sessions, at least that I've been to. I'm still sort of taking in all those things that we can then take forward. But of course, as you know, the CGIR came here particularly with our portfolio of new research programs to exchange ideas. And I think you've seen quite a few references of, uh, in a way, the discussions and the commitments that came out of those. Uh, and we have brought here our plans to update our strategy and results framework. Uh, which we really see as an opportunity to take many of the recommendations that you saw here this morning forward. Let me at least uh, highlight a few of them, although if you were a careful listener, there were quite a few references in the various summaries of the chairs that already indicated some of the areas where uh, the CGIR, the CRPs, can take these recommendations forward. And I have four main points, foresight, knowledge, capacity building, and partnerships, very much in line with the themes of the, the conference. So on foresight, as you've heard one of the chairs say, uh, we can commit to further develop the capacity of the CGIR to develop uh, foresight uh, as concrete elements into our work. Of course, we are participating in the, the GFAR hub on foresight. Uh, ISPC, our Science and Partnership Council, is conducting foresight studies, uh, and there was a good session here of our CRP on policies, market, and institutions, all focused on foresight. And indeed, we see a good opportunity to bring foresight in as a much more concrete element in the updated strategy and results framework. I think that's quite promising, and it's become quite clear over the last year and through this conference how we can do that. So on knowledge, you heard Enrica Porcari say that we have as a CGIR committed to become an open access organization. And that's quite important. We'll bring online much more of our data. And of course, that refers to uh, who works with us, for instance. You've heard people call for opportunities to see you know, how many women, how many youth are working with us, and how much progress we are making there. Uh, we've heard people say, we need more of your research results online. That's happening in many areas. Uh, and finally, we are working hard. That's a real focus of the strategy and result framework to develop clear development outcomes for our programs. And we'll put our results online so that the monitoring of our progress towards outcomes uh, is part of that commitment to open access. On capacity building, uh, many people know, and some of that was reflected here in, in the meetings as well, that this year we focused on gender research as a cross-cutting issue uh, across all of our uh, research programs. We've developed a strategy for gender research for all of the CGIR for the first time, and each of the CRPs have developed strategies on how to mainstream gender research in each of the programs. 
We're looking forward next year to really see that become part and parcel of each of the work programs. For capacity buildings, we're making a commitment here to do a similar process of developing an overall strategy of having each of the programs develop strategies and then take that forward. And of course, we had heard a lot here about youth. Capacity building is a fairly diffuse term, but underneath that, we definitely see opportunities to engage with youth to provide opportunities for young scientists to come into the system. And frankly, we badly need that. To see all the young people here in this conference is really the promise for us in agriculture that the new generation is willing to engage. For quite a few years, it was difficult to get people to come and pick agriculture as a new topic. And I think just in time, as food security is back on the agenda, as the science in our centers is really exciting, young people see that and engage. So that is uh, absolutely a commitment from, from the CGIR to engage with youth. On partnerships, we've heard a lot of good recommendations. Ken Kasman brought a number of those out, that we do need guidelines and standards to have effective partnerships, that we need to build partnerships to deliver outcomes, that we need to reward partnerships for their performance, that we need to have whole system partnerships, and particularly also that we have to have innovative funding arrangements that don't constrain partnerships but promote and reward partnerships. And of course, as we do our priority setting exercises for the strategy and results framework, uh, that's an opportunity to engage and, and form uh, those partnerships and make sure that all our partners are at the table. Finally, I have the pleasure to uh, share with you here to announce, launch in, in, in some terms, our commitment to uh, measure the perception that our partners have of the CGIR. We know that when we go from CRP to CRP, all the folks in those programs work hard to build strong partnerships, but our percep perception on the inside of the CGIR of how well we are doing that is often not quite the same as the perception we hear from our partners. So we're launching a stakeholder perception survey. We've contracted Globescan. We've asked each of our CRPs to list the 200 of their most important partners, and we'll go out with a survey to all those folks, and we'll listen and get a good feedback, we hope, a good baseline to understand not how we think we are doing in partnerships, but how our partners think we are doing. And we'll use that as a baseline and develop an action program to, if you like, improve our performance going forward. Of course, all these things, foresight, uh, open access, capacity building, partnerships, they're all means to an end. They're all supposed to help us do better on what we're really all about. And the CGIR is a partnership for a food secure future. So I was very pleased to see uh, one of the chairs bring up the overall commitment to the zero hunger challenge and how we can bring that in as a, a guiding light at the very top of our, of our pyramid uh, next year in our priority setting exercises as we are indeed now firmly committed to developing outcomes. Not just publications in impact journals, that will still be important as a quality control mechanism, but we as a CGIR are absolutely committed to have development outcomes at the system level and to show how each of our research programs can contribute to attaining those system outcomes leading to meeting the zero hunger challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Three minutes to sum up this richness. GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research, is not just a forum. It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst for action. It's a catalyst for change. It's about all of you. It's about your commitments, your actions. What I'm so impressed by, not just over these last three days, but also in your preparatory work before then, the way you've been coming together and learning how to work together is that we are actually really creating real partnerships here. Not driven by money, not driven by what's on the table, what can I grab, but driven by our drive and our need to work together. Because that's how we're going to achieve the changes that Frank has just referred to. That's how we're going to achieve zero hunger. And without that, we are all letting down the people we serve. 
So what I'm delighted by is in this incredibly rich discussion that we've had over these last few days, that we're actually getting away from me and my institution and into how I can contribute with you to these end goals. And that's a big shift, and I think the CGR reform has been a major catalyst in that change, that we're recognizing we have to think about outcomes. We have to think about how do we get to where we all want to be. And these processes of improving our foresight, improving our partnership, improving our capacities so that we can deliver that are essential. And from here, GFAR, as the, as the global mechanism bringing you all together, we're here at the Secretariat, we're here to serve you, to help you to build these actions forward, to make these changes that you're now committing to. And I'm delighted the language of the slides is no longer, we recommend that someone does this. It's about we're going to do this over the next two years, and you know what, we're going to come back in two years' time, and we're going to hold ourselves to account for what we're doing and how we're doing it with other people. That's the process of change. That's something that even five or six years ago, perhaps none of us could have conceived that we can work together in this way to deliver the change that we know needs to happen. And it's happening in so many practical ways. I started to add up how many new platforms have been established in the last two years to bring people together, and I kind of lost count. So many actions are happening now, but we're bringing it together in a coherent way, in a focused way, and it's down to all of you your commitments, your actions, and we're delighted that you're so on board with making these changes. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've just been reminded that we've run out of time, and uh, in accordance to the allocation that was given to us for this panel, and this is a pity, in a sense, because in this panel, we are supposed to listen to the different uh, impressions and conclusions of, of the, the stakeholders of the GCAR, NGOs, farmers, private sector, advisory services, education, national research and international organizations. Don't worry, we're going to go through it, but that means that we will have to, to postpone our, our coffee break. So I would like to invite uh, to join us at this stage fr from the farmers, uh, re representatives of farmer Ajay Jakar and Robert Carlson. From the NGOs, Sonali Bisht. From the private sector, Ernesto Brovelli. From the advisory services, Christine Davis. From the education, Martin Croft. From the national research institutions, Alvaro Roel. And from the international organizations, Patrick Caron. Welcome. And um, in view of the time, I will ask you to, to be uh, brief into, in your interventions. But I, what I would like you to, to tell us is uh, we've been hearing that GCAR is a process and that we are learning by doing. And so I would like to hear from all of them. Has this been, for, from your perspective, an, an opportunity for engagement, for participating? Have you seen value added in, in this fora and which one? And um, have you sensed progress in GCAR 1? Are we making progress in the implementation of the, of the roadmap, roadmap? And is GCAR, in your view, fit for, 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 fit for purpose, or do we have to bring some adjustments in future, in future meetings of this kind? So this being said, I'd like first to ask uh, uh, Mr. Ajay Jakar, who is from the Baharat Krishak Sama, to take the floor, please. You speak from here? Okay, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Sir, so first and foremost, I want to thank you and your team for organizing GCAR 2012 Summit and giving farmers the opportunity to participate in the process and deliberations. There are positive, visible changes happening at the GCAR, and that's very good. There is a continued great distress and disgust amongst the small farmer families across the world. And the cause is very simple. It's the sickening inequality. The top richest 100 people in the world own, control as much wealth as 1 billion small farmer families. And this cannot go on like this. That's why it becomes absolutely necessary that agriculture research, development, 
and better policies can change that equation. The source of funding leads to an action of a kind, leads to research of a kind, and sometimes that research is undesirable. Farmers must have a more participatory role in the CRP process and activities and objectives so as to be equitable partners. We need structured, transparent process involving the farming community. The task before us is very difficult because urban society controls the policy making of the world. And the focus of the urban society is cheap food. And these is what I would want to deliberate on today. Every government and institution wants to increase agriculture production, while every farmer wants to increase his profitability and become self-sustaining. These are divergent goals, and that must be understood. The irony of the matter is that farmers are the people who are supposed to feed the world, are hungry and poor themselves. And this is because of these divergent goals. Only when farming and agriculture becomes a profitable profession will we be able to achieve these objectives of production, ending hunger and poverty, and it cannot be otherwise. We farmers urge you to change your priorities to make agriculture profitable first, which will actually lead to achieving your other objectives. Our suggestions for the CDR research would be simply as follows. Key to any agriculture revolution is revitalizing extension services to transfer existing knowledge from the laboratories into a farm practice. And there is a lot of existing knowledge which is not reaching the farming community. As we optimize input application, we will reduce use of chemicals and pesticides. There is a yield difference between, I live in a village, I'm a farmer myself, I'm a citrus farmer, and I can tell you from my personal experience that there is a yield difference between the best farm in the village and the worst farm in the village. Then there is a yield difference between the best farm in the village and the nearest research center. If we can bridge that gap, most of our problems will automatically get solved. And that's what we should be focusing on. We need more research in incorporating organic practices into the mainstream, but they have to be economically sustainable. For in any environmentally sustainable idea that everyone's talking about, for it to become a common practice, it must be understood that it has to make economic sense for that individual farmer in the immediate term, in his immediate crop. You cannot go to a farmer and tell him to do environmentally sustainable practices, which will actually save the environment 100 years from now, while he keeps suffering. It's not going to happen, and that must be understood. We must devote more energy and emphasis on animal husbandry and aquaculture because that's what's required for the smallholder farmer. And, it's, and there seems to be a loss of focus on that. Resources are limited for most developing countries and for most individual, in fact, for all individual small farmer families. Problems of developing countries are far more critical than the developed world, and success stories of the developed world cannot be replicated in developing countries. It is very important that vulnerable societies and, and countries to incorporate new technology as a resource liberating mechanism. And that is the way forward. Most small farmers doing farming today are doing so because of lack of other opportunities. Only residual talent is left to work on the farm today. By making agriculture remunerative, we will be able to retain the best youth, the best educated, best, hardworking youth in, in farming. And to achieve that, we, it's, it's very nice because this G-Card has focused on post-harvest also. There's been session on post-harvest uh, application of link, market linkages because without that, the profit on the far, for farm produce is not going to come. There are a lot of success stories and good practices and innovations happening on small fa family farms across, across the world. We need to document these and we need to dissipate that information across the world as has been started by Apari. And that's, that's very important because there's so much that is happening that nobody knows about. So that needs to be done. One thing I'm really um, sad about is that 2012 was the year of the cooperatives. And we would have really hoped that if cooperatives had been a part of this session today because that is the final last mile connectivity to the farmer, to the smallholder farmer. And that's, that's the way forward. This list is just a beginning. It's not complete. And we hope for a better future. And we have hope and we are sure we will get there. Finally, we request that the next G-card 
at least 25% of the members attending the thing, attending the conference, must be from the farming community themselves. Thank you once again for organizing this fabulous event, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we, will hear, we will hear now Robert Carlson from World Farmers Organization. That's a voice for, for farmers as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to condense what I had to say. Uh, our focus as World Farmers Organization is on how do we get farmers to have a voice in the research they need, and then how do we get them to express that voice and to apply the research that is available or that they want to get accomplished uh, to their farm so that they can increase production, improve their lives, and improve food security for the world. That is also the goal, as I see it, of the G-Card Roadmap, that six-point plan. And let me just discuss a couple of those points uh, in the plan that I think uh, could use some modification, not a change in direction, not a chart off the map or anything like that, but just a little modification, and I think a little more room in the car or the truck for the farmers along that roadmap. Um, one of the points, the second point in the G-Card Roadmap is the need for true and effective partnership. Let me say that partnerships are at least two sides, maybe more, but at least two sides. And on the farmer side, I'm going to be frank with you, I think we farmers need to do more on the partnership side uh, to get farmers involved in the process of research. Farmers want research. They do. They know it's important. They know, especially in this time of climate change, that they need help and adjusting to variations in climates, pests, increased demand for food. They know they need research, they want research, but we need to get them in partnership with the actual researchers to have a dialogue on what can work and what is practical. Not a wish list of dreams, but what is practical to be done on their farms that can help them. The farmer needs to say what they need, the researcher needs to say yes, and this is how we can go about uh, trying to accomplish that. Um, Greater capacity to generate action is, I think, the, the fourth point in the roadmap. If that means greater capacity to build farm organizations, that's fine. We need to do that. We need to get organized farmers in all parts of, of the developing world, uh, especially smallholder farmers who sometimes lack uh, that very institution, a farm organization, to help them express their voices and to disseminate information to farmers. I agree with that. But there's no magic bullet there. There's no magic way to accomplish that. Um, you can't impose um, uh, a desire for people to speak. They need to come up from the ground with that desire. They need to be maybe inspired. They need to be motivated. But they need to feel ownership. They need to speak for themselves. And I would say um, to get things going, because we do need to get things going, we need to get research applied. Let's always keep in our minds what my uh, friend, a woman farmer from Africa, uh, said to me at the end of a, a long meeting, a UN-sponsored meeting uh, about a year ago. Uh, she stood up in the back of the meeting, or not in the back of the meeting, she stood up at the end of the meeting and asked a question. And it was, a, it was after a long session of concluding about what the meeting had come to, and she said, this is all very fine, and you're all very intelligent, and you're all very educated but how is this going to help me on my farm to make it better? That is what uh, the voice that keeps uh, ringing in my head as we look at all these processes and all these cross-cutting committees and all the things we need to do. That's inevitable. We need to have processes developed, but we need to get action down on the ground where the farmer is, and we need to see uh, success stories. We need to be practical. Um, and we need um, to be able to measure those projects that we form as partnerships, and we need to be able to hold the partners accountable. Having said that, we also need to understand that we won't have instant gratification in these projects. They're not easy. They're not quick. And sometimes you have to fail in order to learn how to succeed later. We need to have some patience, but we do need to have accountability, um, and we do need to have the ability to measure the projects. In sum, the G-Card Roadmap is usable, it's useful, it's uh, forward-looking, but it does need a bit more detail and more definition, 
and as I said, a larger space on the road for farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we will hear the voice of the NGOs. Sonali Bisht from IMHC, please. Good morning, friends. Here I'm speaking on behalf of the CSO community, which is a large, much larger community than that is represented here. Um, the GCARD 1 recognized that smallholder producers provide food to about 70% of the world population, as well as livelihoods to an equal number. This has brought the NGO interest and response to the processes initiated by GCART, especially the multi-stakeholder processes which enabled different stakeholders to come together. However, the very nature of these producers, the smallholder producers, who are resource poor and vulnerable, requires direction of research efforts, not only for higher yield and pest resistance, but also to ensure low external input, low cost, low risk, climate change resilient, technologies and practices which are sustainable, protect soil, water, and climate, promote biodiversity, and do not contaminate the environment. Research has a role in supporting and enabling smallholder farmers, producers, to continue to provide nutritious food to a growing population. We as NGOs have a role in awareness generation, farmer participatory technology validation, and providing the last mile linkage to research, to development continuum, and policy advocacy for upscaling for wider impact. The sensitivity and attention paid to these aspects varies from CRP to CRP, if we take those as an example. However, since CRPs only lay a broad framework, we hope that CRPs will focus on working on demand-driven technologies in close collaboration with farmers, NGOs, and other stakeholders to ensure that these are affordable, acceptable, environment-friendly, and sustainable technologies and practices. GCARD 1 was a landmark in its emphasis on collective roles and actions needed by all partners to achieve development impacts at scale. The result has been that stakeholders, including NGOs, are now a part of every consultative process and meeting. However, in many cases, their presence is still merely symbolic. Small numbers, weak voices, lack of institutional structures and processes necessary for true representation. Some introspection on importance given to stakeholders, especially NGOs, is important here for ensuring better inclusion. The process of inclusion of NGOs and FAOs as partners can be made more open and transparent and credible. However, since this, the process which has already been initiated is still very much appreciated, but it can be made better and stronger. Collective action can be taken to develop selection and work processes which are credible and offer best chance of success and return on investment. We are hopeful that from GCAR 2 to GCAR 3, we will move to more effective, vibrant, equal partnerships, collective commitments, collective action, and collective accomplishments. 
Capacity building is needed to understand and work with each other as stakeholders in achievement of common goals. Scientists are often excited by discoveries which NGOs who work closely with smallholder producers at the grassroots to improve their lives and livelihoods would see as waste of time and money if it cannot solve their problems, meet expectations, and future aspirations. Structured events like GCARD and institutionalized practices serve to bridge attitudinal and knowledge gaps among all stakeholders, including scientists and NGOs. Jointly, we can promote processes of co-creation of knowledge and practice through farmer-led participatory research, joint experimentation by farmers and researchers, in addition to fundamental research, which is very important. Our collective commitments to foresight, partnerships, capacity building have already been articulated in the sessions which have gone before. In conclusion, I would just like to put forward some key messages. We NGOs are committed to work for success of research and field-based projects focused on increasing incomes and improving livelihoods of smallholder producers on sustainable basis while providing for food and nutrition security to their family members, communities, and other consumers through low-cost, sustainable, risk-resilient, environmentally, socially, and culturally accepted production practices. We are committed to take part in the collective movement from symbolic to more real and equitable partnerships and collaborations at all levels, planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. This in turn requires building of database, institutional structures, and best practices for more credible and effective NGO involvement and representation. Thank you. Thank you. Now from the private sector, we're going to hear Ernesto Brovelli from Coca-Cola Company and Sustainable Agriculture Platform. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, before I start, I just wanted to clarify why is even Coca-Cola here? I think it's a question that needs to be addressed. People ask me that all the time. Well, uh, Coca-Cola is actually one of the biggest buyers of sugars in the world, if not the largest. We're a huge buyer of orange juice in the world for our um, Minute Maid brands. Uh, other juices as well. Also buyers of tea and coffee for products that we have in many markets. So as you realize, Coca-Cola has a big presence in the agricultural sector. Um, so this is what has brought me here. Additionally, I also lead Sustainable Agriculture Initiative, which is a trade organization that congregates 44 food and beverage companies around the world, started 10 years ago by the inspiration of Nestle, Unilever, and Danone. And since then, a number of companies from Coke to Kraft to General Mills and Kellogg's have joined in pursuit of what we consider sustainable agriculture. So for all of us, and for us particularly at Coca-Cola, sustainable agriculture has become a key mandate. Um, now, when I talk about, when we, when we talk about private sector involved in agriculture, we need to realize that there's many, many stakeholders and many voices that can be heard. I represent the food and beverage sector, but obviously you are familiar that input providers, manufacturer, equipment manufacturers, uh, even the pharmaceutical industry touch the, uh, our agricultural sector. So there's many, many players, and we do not represent a monolithic view about uh, agriculture. Now, having said that, I was very, very pleased with a lot of the comments that were made throughout the session. Uh, many of them resonated very clearly with how we see agriculture in my own company and in Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. Some of the messages that resonated very well are this idea that, agricult that agricultural research needs to be collaborative and value chain focused. For a long time, I'm an agronomist by training. I did uh, agricultural research for a number of years. Um, we have worked in silos. We have worked in silos trying to, you know, university research centers, the food industry, the input providers. 
we cannot longer do that if we really uh, attempt to bring about development. We have to interlink all these sectors. And by doing so, we will become collaborative by nature. I can cite an example that we're doing in Costa Rica where by just merely partnering with a supplier of Coca-Cola, Earth University, a local school in Costa Rica, we are bringing about change and, and doing um, agricultural research of this participatory nature that I'm talking about. The other thing is that I hear, I heard very loudly throughout the conference that uh, agricultural research needs to be inclusive. And by that we mean smallholders, we mean women involved in agriculture, we mean women even involved in microenterprises. Because as we are listening to the food industry, many women are involved in microenterprises. And again, they are demand, even though they are not producing agricultural inputs, they are demanding those inputs. So what are their needs? Are they in the production sector? Are they post harvest sector? How can we help them? Um, the other thing is that as we go to different geographies to uh, work with smallholders, we need to be receptive not only to agricultural technologies, but to indigenous know-how. Uh, indigenous know-how. There's a wealth of indigenous know-how know -how around the world. Uh, namely, we heard a couple of people from India. India has a wealth of abilities in harvesting water. We all know how critical the water resource is. Coca-Cola is extremely concerned. And there has been throughout the civilizations a number of efforts of trying to trap or harvest water, and we seem to have neglected those. So really the importance of, yes, working with emerging technologies, but also being attentive to indigenous know-how. And very related to that, the idea that we need to be cognizant to resources, whether they are you know, water, whether they are emissions and energy. We heard from the president of Uruguay uh, a very nice uh, introduction to his talk saying that we have been a wasteful civilization. We, we did not pay attention to the resources, we, the very basic resources that we rely on. So I think that's, that's very critical. And the last aspect as a scientist, I really have to say that whatever we do needs to be science validated. We cannot just presume that because technology or know-how is, is indigenous and it has proven to be you know, uh, sustainable or, or profitable, if it's not science validated, we, we have to be very careful. So I think I'm very glad that the private sector has been called to this, this meeting of, of researchers because we really need your expertise in trying to define our path forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine Davis is, is next, and she's going to give us the point of view of the advisory services. Thank you very much. Good morning. What is the advisory service response to what we've been hearing here at GCARD? We've heard an awful lot about the different challenges, um, but we've also at the same time heard a lot of solutions as well, solutions that are based on partnerships. And I really think that addressing these global challenges requires a substantially enhanced use of knowledge and advisory systems by limited resource farmers and other actors in the rural arena. This, though, implies new roles and also new capacities for extension and advisory services, which are really a fundamental institution to supporting smallholder farmers and other actors in the rural sector. So, Building these new capacities at the individual, the organizational, and the system level is really the essence of what we call the new extensionist, in quotes. To deal with this challenge of capacities for extension and advisory services can only be met in partnership with all the other sectors and also with the inclusion of stakeholders such as women and youth and by using ICTs and other uh, opportunities that we have out there. GFROS, the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, and our partners are going to help move this capacity agenda forward for rural advisory services so that these providers, whether they be farmer organizations, public or private sector, NGOs, or others who are providing services, can really effectively play this critical role of linking different actors within the innovation system, brokering linkages, providing technical advice and also empowerment so that we can really improve the lives of smallholder farmers and other rural actors. So I think this is our collective goal. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. <laughs> Education is next, and Martin Croft from the University of Wageningen is going to give us the point of view. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope the microphone works well. It's, um, it's not easy to go in such a short period of time through 20 or 25 short presentations, but apparently when I look at the faces, as far as we can see it from here, uh, people are still excited because there's so much energy in all the things that have been said, and especially in the set of recommendations that came out of the different teams. I think sometimes you can ask also what's new, but many things are new because times are changing. And I would like to give some examples. I was also asked to give um, a little bit of broader perspective from the perspective of the education. I will take it a little bit broader also to see that things really uh, are changing and that the initiatives that are taken at this GCAR 2 meeting are very essential and very promising for the future. Now, so it's not business as usual and something has to happen. Now, first about education, what I didn't hear this morning, we have to make sure that our system and our whole uh, sector is attractive for students. Because that was happening in the past, 10 years ago. In Wageningen, we had a major problem. Students didn't want to come to our university anymore. Not only in my country. So, um, in the first place, we need an attractive sector. So, the reform is ongoing in the CGIR, and I'm very pleased to see what's happening. But also elsewhere. We see it worldwide and also uh, in times of crisis, financial crisis, we see that the agri-food sector is the only sector that is stable. In my country, the agri-food business is just keeps on going, is even growing these days. So it's not a sector of the past, but it's the sector of the future. And I think we have to keep on explaining society and policymakers that this is not just essential for our food production, but it's the essential sector also for our business. And a long time also for young people, for students, agriculture has seen as being something from the past. Now in the Netherlands, since two years now, fortunately uh, they call agri-food and horticulture two top sectors in the top sector policy. And they start becoming proud and it takes time. But now, step by step, people start realizing that the Netherlands, you know, it's so small on the map, you can't even see it on a world map. But we are the second exporter in agri-food products in the world. Sometimes I also ask, how is it possible? Um, and we, of course, it's Wageningen, we have a large institution, we have many of them. But you have to realize also that institutions such as my organization, Wageningen University and Research Center, has the same size as the CGIAR. And there are many of these institutes out there. And that's also why I was so pleased at the G20 meeting in Mexico that we all decided that linking the large CRPs of the CGIR also with the large national programs worldwide in all these beautiful institutions. And I think this is also something essential. And also donors, development corporation, they start realizing again that agriculture can be the kickstart of the economy. Eight years ago in the Netherlands, they stopped all financing of agricultural issues in uh, international development cooperation. Today, it's the main focus. Agri, food and food security is on the map again. And fortunately, they decided, they signed two weeks ago, before the new government came in, fortunately, they signed for a $35 million uh, program annually, so $140 million for four years for the CRPs. And I'm very proud that my government uh, is so visionary in reinvesting in the CGIAR. But how can we make it happen? Going back to education. Now, what is needed is that we have effective systems for capacity building and, systems, uh, and system development. And it must result in coherent research and education systems. And so first, we have to make not only the sector attractive for students, but also our educational systems must be very attractive for potential students. We have to get the best students in the world for our sector. So we have seen that also in our organization, because 10 years ago we were almost gone as a university, and we set up a new strategy. And that's also what I heard this morning. It's not about just agriculture. We call it food and food production, the living environment in relation to people health, lifestyle, and livelihood, and to include nutrition. And the whole chain is, I think, essential for the work of the future also within this whole domain. Chain development, business development, we heard it just before, and that's why I'm so pleased that all the sectors are on stage. The farmers organizations, the NGOs, but also industry. So, um, 
Today, for example, in my organization, student numbers doubles. The university is um, elected uh, as the best university in the Netherlands. And we have an international organization. We have it also in France. We also have it in Denmark, in many countries. So international students, 40% of our master students are international from 120 nationalities. And for example, we have from Africa only 250 PhD students and master students. So, and we are trying also to work on a brain gain system. So that these students that they work in Africa, they stay in Africa and build up institutions in uh, that continent as well. So um, with this, I would like to highlight three components because it's of course not good to have only students going to universities like Cornell, Davis, Wageningen, whatever. We need that as well. But at the same time, we have to build up education systems everywhere where it's not uh, developed yet. So, and that's. One of the interesting actions we've seen this week is also, for example, to start developing regional and international networks for capacity development and making strong curricula for, the, for our students. And uh, one initiative I would like to mention is uh, the Team Africa initiative. It was just mentioned. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were in Kampala and Reform and Anna Fey, the organizations for universities in Africa, they really took the initiative in getting all the ministers in their countries in education and agriculture together. And today, they start a large initiative to really improve curricula in African universities with the help, of course, also of universities such as uh, Wageningen, Cornell, and others. And what is new in our teaching system? Really quite something, because basically we have to study these very complex issues. And we don't look only at the growing of, for example, maize in a given system. No, it's a complex system. So we need uh, novel approaches and also the linkage of social sciences and natural sciences. And we put a lot of effort in it. It's very complex. It's not easy. But that's the way to go. And that's where we have together developed new systems and opportunities. The second I would like to mention is public-private partnerships. We discussed it in Mexico. And uh, we, uh, my, my, for example, the Ministry of uh, Development Cooperation is also now getting interested, finally, because people start realizing that we need to work with the industry as well to get the real value chain in agri-food keep to get it going. And the last one, to keep on getting donor support for capacity building, because it's not easy. For example, three years ago, uh, our program, the NUFIC program, was almost gone, and we had this meeting in Kampala, so, and uh, I was talking with Monty there, and I said, okay, can Farah indicate, if you wish, to my ministry that how important capacity building is? And fortunately, we got several of those uh, support letters and uh, support phone calls, and the program, fortunately, is still there. I think it's very important that donors realize capacity building is there as well. It's important. So, in conclusion, uh, the agri-food sector, I think, can be the, should be the backbone of our economies, the stable backbone also in times of crisis and can be the kickstart as well. The second one, uh, we must show to our students the excitement that we all share about the sector and about uh, agricultural research for development in that sense and attract the best students internationally. And of course, linking agricultural production to food and nutrition because it's not only calories, it's also nutritional value that we have to work on. So GCARD, I think it's a very strong step forward again. A lot of recommendations. Let's together go on and make it work. And I'm convinced that we passed the tipping point. The tipping point uh, that we move on, basically, that we can uh, increase really strongly the impact of AR4D. The donors like it. Everybody uh, supports it. Our society, our societies internationally, still have to recognize it. So let's work on this together, and I'm convinced at the next G-Card meeting we will have show also some uh, large successes of our effort also in education. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alvaro Roel from the INEA Uruguay will speak on behalf of National Research. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to everybody. I'm going to make my reflection or my consideration in Spanish. First of all, it's an honor and a great responsibility to speak to the national research centers of the region. 
al final de esta importantísima conferencia, pero a su vez estamos en, en la mitad del camino de esta ruta 2010-2014 y por lo tanto estamos en un momento clave, digamos, de potenciar y poder influenciar la estrategia, ya que seguramente el próximo GCAR ya será de conclusiones y de, y de definiciones. Está claro cuál es el foco. El foco es la seguridad alimentaria, el foco son los 800 millones de habitantes de este planeta que no logran cubrir las necesidades mínimas alimentarias todos los días. Esperamos que en el día de ayer, aquellos que participaron del día de campo, hayan podido apreciar la riqueza de los recursos naturales de este país, pero que también puede ser extensivo a esta región y a este, a este continente, pero recursos, recursos naturales que están insertos en sistemas productivos, el gran desafío de la productividad y la sustentabilidad, en el gran desafío que la alegría de hoy no sea el lamento del mañana. Pero dentro de este contexto quisiéramos aportar eh, dos reflexiones. La primera, algo que ya, ya ha sido dicho a lo largo de estos días, sin duda que esta región es parte de la solución. Es parte de la solución por su capacidad productiva y por lo tanto entendemos que es importante poder potenciar la mirada no solamente hacia, la, hacia los problemas, sino también hacia dónde están las soluciones, ya que está claro que en los próximos 10 años vamos a tener que generar más alimento que lo generado en toda la historia de la humanidad. La segunda reflexión, la segunda consideración que quisiéramos hacer es que esta región no solamente tiene recursos naturales y capacidad productiva, sino que tiene también un desarrollo institucional, un desarrollo tecnológico, una experiencia exportadora, una experiencia de incluir al sector privado y a los productores, tantas veces dicho a lo largo de la mañana de hoy, a lo largo de estos dos días, y por eso creemos que los sistemas nacionales de investigación, los sistemas regionales de investigación, deben de potenciar la articulación de alianzas para poder ser parte de las ideas más avanzadas en los términos de investigación, de la investigación de frontera, de esos saltos cualitativos que vamos a tener que poder generar y poder poner en la región y en el mundo si es que queremos realmente resolver este problema global. Muchas gracias. Last but, but not least, Patrick Caron uh, of CIRAD, who will speak on behalf of the international organizations. Patrick. Muchas gracias, Carlos. I have the strange feeling to get into a lift and I have 34 seconds to try to convince you about one single idea uh, before you rush to coffee break. Um, the problem is that we are 500 people in the same lift and that will be difficult, but let's try. Well, as Monty said, GCARD is about a process. GCARD 1 was about where to go to transform agricultural research for development and we produced a roadmap. GCAD 2 was how to deal with that. I move from one session to the other, and what I will share with you some of my observations, what happens in here in Punta del Este. There were three entry points. Foresight first. Well, thanks to the huge preparatory work of the Foresight Hub, we brought together a variety of experiences, and there is now a capacity to rely on a community that away from the crystal, crystal ball can really develop, have a framework to develop a, a way to think forward and to act now. This has to be continued for two reasons. First, the challenge to improve the link and the relationship between foresight exercise and research programming. And the second is that we always have to identify better the type of knowledge we will have to produce to be relevant in 10 years' time. That's not easy. 
The second, capacity building. Capacity building, it was not only about training, although training is, of course, an important part. It let me affirm that and state that there will be no sustainable development with a local, national capacity to produce knowledge that is relevant to solve the problem. And there will no be such a capacity with a strengthening of, the, of, of, of this capacity of producing knowledge. On the contrary, what we do observe at the moment is a dramatic erosion of this capacity in some countries. This is just not acceptable because we will not go, move towards sustainable development with uh, relying only on the transfer of some knowledge from the best laboratories to some poorest country. This is just not acceptable, and we have to look at that. I have a dream about that, is that uh, one day we will uh, not only talk about research for development, but development through research. That is a dream for GCAR 10. That is a way of looking at the production of knowledge as a development driver. Well, partnership. Partnership, the word was very uh, uh, used, and uh, we brought together a lot of different experiences. And uh, the launch of the Tropical Agriculture Platform is re really a very promising initiative to continue learn and draw lessons from that. So, so what's next on the basis of that? We've got the pieces of a puzzle. We've got a lot of recommendations that were brought to us this morning and that very relevant to move forward. But we've got a piece of a puzzle to do business in a different way and to address the roadmap of where to go. But do, we do not know yet how to put the pieces together exactly. And uh, we cannot certainly claim that we did it already. So we have got a huge challenge in front of us. And I would share with you one single proposal. Let's launch business as unusual. Business as usual is, of course, uh, an, uh, not an, an option. We do agree with that. But we have to look at very different ways to design, if I use the words of the G20 meeting that happened in, in Guadalajara in Mexico, recently, is we have to identify new ways of identifying research priorities and targets to facilitate and to facilitate collaboration between public and private sectors organizations. We have to promote, as it was said in the first movie from our Uruguayan hosts, to promote the agro-inteligente way of looking at agriculture. And for that, we have to combine three pillars. First, a mapping all, all, of all contribution from national, regional, international organization, public and private. Second, a, a consultation process involving all research stakeholders. Third, a strategic thinking through an analysis of trends, foresight, and impact assessment. What would be different? There would be two main differences. First is to combine the three pillars in research, designing, and implementation. And then that would be a reversion, a total reversion of the way we operate so far. And that would be a politically led process at the national or at the regional level instead of being the sum of institutional agenda. This proposal was put forward in one of the sessions I, 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 I went through uh, by uh, Koraf and Koraf Ricard, who suggested to do it like that. And, and the, 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 the assumption was that at the national level, the, the, the research agenda cannot be the sum of what the national, the NAS are doing, or the CG centers are doing even aligned with the CADEP process, or the, the IRG, the CIRAD, the whatever, all the institution. So we have a very concrete proposal to move towards GCAR 3. GCAR 3 would then be a moment where we could look at the outcome of such processes. 
And then GCARD would not be an event. GCARD would be a process with global events that could make it possible to outscale and upscale innovations. I would, before leaving you rushing to the coffee, I would share with you a last dream, that is to invent a new global orchestration of agricultural research to build upon, to acknowledge, as that was said by Frank this morning, to acknowledge and build upon the CG reform, to go beyond the CG reform and to promote a broader reform of the whole agricultural research and learning system. That may, would make it possible to address the terrible challenges of the future. I will not back to that. But by doing so, what's for sure is that we could align and in the same time contribute to three major political commitments. As it was stated this morning, 2014 as the United Nations Year of Family Agriculture. Second, the revision of the Millennium Development Goals as stated in Rio recently by 2015. And uh, thirdly, the inclusion of agriculture in the climate change global agenda. Well, as a director of an international organization, I just would like to say that I commit my institution and express my willingness to play such a game and to deliver the change together. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick, for your, for your intervention and your two very colorful, colorful thoughts at the end, uh, in line with your shirt colors. One, business as unusual. That's what we have to aim for. And, um, and the other one um, is the, the dream that you have of converting research for development to development for research. I think this is an inspiring conclusion of our work. I would like to ask for a round of applause for all our panelists, please. Now, we're supposed to, to, to end this session with um, some comments uh, by myself and, and by Monty on the, on the conference itself. Uh, let me reassure you that as, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm not, and for sake of, sake of time, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I think, um, and also because our CEO uh, has been able also to intervene in this session. Let me tell you that as far as I'm concerned, it has been a, a very useful experience. We have learned a number of lessons. We have listened very carefully. We are ready to adjust a number of things. Some of the, some of the lessons that were drawn are, uh, are important for our work. There are other lessons that we drew from, from this meeting that will be will need to be incorporated in any future meeting. I think that there are some lessons uh, of how to do things a little bit different are also noted, but I won't go into the details. But before I close and give the floor to Monty, I would like to do two things. First of all, to, to thank the Minister of, of Agriculture, Tabari Aguirre, not only for his participation and his, his wisdom, but also because he's been with us for the whole week. And this is something important that we recognize. And secondly, uh, we have talked about the International Organizing Committee quite a bit during this meeting, led by, by Paroda, Dr. Paroda, who deserves an applause. <laughs> but perhaps we haven't heard so much from the national uh, committee that organized and put a lot of effort during the last uh, three months, during the last nine months, in order to make this a success. So, uh, is Mario Allegri in, in the room? Well, I'm sorry that he's not, but I'd, 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 like to thank, I'd like to thank Mario and all his team, because he had a big team uh, of, of different organizations in Uruguay who put a lot of effort and, and that made uh, this conference a success. So, Monty, the floor is yours to. And, and one, one final thing, uh, we will come back to a session afterwards in which uh, we will, that's a, the closing session in which we will hear uh, a number of speeches in, and, and a closing by the Minister of Agriculture. And I would like you all to bring your headphones because he's going to make it in Spanish. Okay, thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries, 
We are really honored by your presence here with us today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your advice. Thank you for your criticism. Thank you, constructive criticism, I mean. And thank you, you know, for your significant input to the success of this meeting. I believe that we all prepared very well before the meeting and during the meeting. And I think this is reflected in the richness of the discussion, the presentation, the quality of all the issues discussed uh, 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 during these past three days. And I would like to extend special acknowledgments to the President of the Republic of Uruguay, uh, His Excellency Joel Mujica, to the Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Tabere Aguirre, and to the President of IFAD, Dr. Kanayo Wanzi, for their gracing this event and contributing so well to the discussions that we've had in the last three days. Actually, GCAD, GIFA considers GCAD to be the key instrument to achieve its mission of enhancing the impact of agricultural research for development by improving its relevance, coherence, and efficiency. I think the commitments that we have laid down today in the past two, three days, the commitment from the CG Consortium, the commitment from the UFA Secretariat, and the various stakeholders group, I believe, constitute a huge agenda of action for the next two years. As these commitments, this agenda have been put so very quickly and so very effectively by all of you, I believe that there will be need to streamline the actions that we have identified. There will be need to further de define the clear targets that we want to achieve and to refine rules and responsibilities, including leadership rules that will be taken by some of us. But I think that in all of this, we need to keep our eyes open. We need to think of the big issues, the big targets, and of course, the purpose of our coming together in the last three days, and that is lift people out of hunger and poverty and prevent those that have got out from sliding back or going back into that vicious circle of poverty. I think I'm going to repeat this again because I said it at the opening session with close to one billion people going to bed and waking up hungry. I think there's no rest for us, the scientists. No rest for us, the uh, development partners. No rest for us, the, 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 the farmers. All along the chain, whether it's extension or NGO group, and all of us, we have a role to play to make sure that nobody in this earth goes to bed hungry at any time. And until we are able to do that, I don't think that we should get the normal sleep that we're thinking of. I think because we have the resources to be able to produce enough for these people, and we have the resources to be able to generate the technologies, the innovations that will drive these people out of, out of poverty. I believe that GCAD 2 is taking us very close to that working together, addressing the key issues that will enable us to do our job and do it properly to make sure that we translate all what we're doing into 
development impact, improving livelihood, reducing hunger and poverty, improving the well-being of the resource-poor farmers. I believe that we are getting closer and closer to doing that. So I would like to thank all of you for these wonderful three days. And I would like to acknowledge the very close collaboration between GIFA and the CG Consortium in organizing this meeting. Um, every inch of the way we were together, the CG centers participated. And so today, if we say that we have succeeded to some extent, I believe that the glory, the credit is for all of us because we've joined hands together from the start to date. I would also like to make sure to assure you that we commit ourselves at GIFA to harnessing these strong complementarities of GIFA and the CGIAR to follow up on the outcomes of these three days deliberation. I also would like to acknowledge the dedication and untiring efforts of the GCAD um, organizing committee. Whether it's the organizing committee at the international level or organizing committee at the local level, uh, uh, all played their role and all were very dedicated. And this is why we've seen this very good organization within these very good facilities, within this beautiful country. That's why we've got the kind of success that we're talking about, because we were able to create that conducive atmosphere for us to de deliberate effectively, for us to put the key issues on the table and ensure, like I said, uh, uh, effective or constructive criticisms and to give inputs. So we can say that this is a conference, but this is not a conventional conference. I believe that all of you have contributed, and I believe that over 200 speakers took the floor you know, and contributed to the meeting. And the other, the remaining, I believe, 450 uh, people that are participating here also contributed significantly. Before this, Raj will tell you that he communicated with over 1,000 institutions before this meeting. And the local organizing committee also did that so that we get your contributions as to what the program should look like, as to what, how we should move forward, and what, how we structure the presentations. So there's been a richness, as Mark mentioned this morning, of ideas that have been put on the table. There have been significant interactions of various institutions, and we've been building partnerships, strengthening old ones, building new ones and all for one major goal, for us to move together collectively to achieve that goal or development objectives that we have defined for ourselves. Improve global agricultural research for development to contribute to improving livelihood, food security, and getting people out of poverty. You from GCAD 1, you asked for the science. I believe that in GCAD 2, we've given you the science. It's very obvious from the summaries that have been given. It's very obvious from the priorities that we have drawn and the challenges that we've put in place that we want to address today, tomorrow, and for the future to come. You've asked for development to be part of GCAD. We've given you that. And I think that you've had the voices of the NGOs, the farmers' organizations, and all of these. And I believe that we have succeeded in putting the farmers in the center of our operations, in the driving seat, steering the ship for us to move forward. Now, today, we realize that we shouldn't think for the farmers. We should think with the farmers. We should define their priorities with them, their focus, their need, and reshape our interventions, you know, to fit those needs. And 
You said you want the youths, you want gender to be part of it. We've adequately covered that. I can list, go on and list and list and list, but I think that generally we've done very well. I have not, I'm not saying that it is perfect. I'm not saying that we've covered everything, but I think that we've set, laid down a very good foundation for us to undertake our work much more collectively and effectively to promote agricultural research for development, uh, global agricultural research for development. I will change the topic a little bit. I just have one or two minutes, minutes Mr. Minister and ladies and gentlemen. The next GCAD is supposed to come in 2014. Some people have proposed 2015, because sometimes it's a little bit too close to be holding GCAD. So if you agree to 2015, we make it 2015, every three years. Every, all those who say 2015 say hi. Is that, am I hearing you? No, only one voice. <laughs> anyway, maybe we leave it at 2014, because that's what I see. Aha, uh -huh. so people want it every two years. Okay, that's very good. But what I want to say is that the first GCAD was ably hosted by France, 2010. This GCAD ably hosted by Uruguay, 2012. The next GCAD, 2014, should be hosted somewhere. And uh, so the expression of interests will come out pretty soon after this meeting, and we would like country to express their interest to host the next GCAD event. Another thing that I want to put on the table is that this might be the last time that I'm talking to all of you in plenary as the chairperson of FARA, of, of GIFA, of GIFA, sorry, I'm hearing two hats, but GIFA hats is primary this time, um, of the chairperson of GIFA, because my term comes to an end in March, 2013, and apparently we started the process because in May, I tabled that my replacement should be discussed by the steering committee, and we've set up a, uh, a search committee from within the steering committee that is headed by uh, Madame Yao of the FAO, that search committee. So basically, what I would like to tell you is that we want to use an open and transparent process to identify the new chairperson of GIFA. We want to use the kind of process that we outlined during the, uh, 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 the roadmap principles, defining priorities region by region. We want to use that kind of process to identify the next uh, GIFA chairperson. So we'll be inviting open nominations of candidates from, and that candidate should come from the developing world, and such nominations should be submitted via the GIFA secretariat to the search committee or directly to the search committee. And we want everybody to, be, to give their own inputs to this so that we get the suitable candidates, man or woman, you know, that will take on the baton and run with the GCAD and the GIFA process. Somebody who represents the stakeholders very well, and also, but somebody who also will provide glo global leadership and new and come up with new insights and ideas, and somebody that will ensure success of the GCAD 3 in 2014. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that this has been a wonderful meeting. Thanks to our host, the Honorable Minister is here with us. Thanks to our host, uh, Uruguay. And I think that we should say very many thanks to the governments, the people of Uruguay for all the facilities that they've provided for taking us to a wonderful food field trip, for having a wonderful dinner last night. And, and I was very happy with that dinner because the beat that you had was an African beat. So I thought I was in Africa, actually. You know, but it was, it was really very good. But I'm going to end by saying, don't forget what we are supposed to do. Lift over close to a million, billion people out of poverty. Until we do that, we have not succeeded. Ladies and gentlemen, I say thanks to the Ministry of Agriculture for their support, overall support, to INIA for organizing a wonderful field trip and, and, and organizing this conference, all those people, local organizing committee members that have contributed to this. 
And I say thanks to the Fund Council and to the other donors that actually made direct contribution to this meeting, including the government of Uruguay. And then I say thanks to the GCAD Secretariat. Mark and his team, I don't think they slept very well in the past months, you know, but I think we've reaped the benefits of that effort, success to this meeting. So once again, I say thank you very much to all of you, and I'm and, and sorry I took a little bit long, but I think that as announced by uh, the coach here, uh, Carlos, we're going to have 15 minutes for break, and during that time, please pick up your microphone, you know, because the Honorable Minister will be talking in uh, Spanish, and, and of course, there will be direct interpretation. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for your patience. Yeah.